Welcome to another episode of Coaching Outdoors podcast and uh, today we are really pleased and excited to be joined by Gary Pratt who is joining us uh, from Bath and uh, we will uh, welcome to yourself Gary. I wonder if you would just take a few brief sentences just to give us an introduction to yourselves and to our listeners. Yeah so I'm Gary Pratt. I'm uh, um, I guess an entrepreneur by history I'm, and I've been involved in tech most of my life since the early 90s so pre-first dot-com boom and as in that world and as a founder but I found myself then at the University of Bath um, as entrepreneur in residence and a teaching fellow so starting to explore not the practical side of entrepreneurship but the more theoretical side and um, and that's where my thinking came together and my We'll talk a bit about my history outdoors, but my, my thinking came together and um, and ended up with my book, The Creativity Factor, about use of the outdoors for thinking and innovation. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still an entrepreneur at heart, but, um, you yeah, know, like to spend as much time outside meeting and talking to people. Outdoors and talking to people, that is what it is all <laughs> about. And I love the title of your book, which we're going to be dipping into in a bit. And I just love this connection, kind of coaching, creativity. It just, it lies at the absolute heart of it. So I think we've got loads to explore. But before we go there, this is our classic tried and tested question, which every guest gets to indulge in. And it's like a little bit of time travel what is your earliest memory of being outdoors and what do you enjoy about being outdoors okay good questions well I've thought about this a lot and probably talked about it enough I think I was you know one answer is I think I was lucky enough to have a um a pretty standard 70s upbringing where we were a bit free free range um and the only holidays we ever had were camping and my parents you know were drawn to the places like fields in mid wales so we never go anywhere popular uh, <laughs> but it but it meant most of my holidays involved mucking around in streams and mountains and and outdoors but i probably the more practical one and and it, when i say it to people they they sort of or I, I describe it to people they always sounds a bit weird but i had a hill behind my house called cabri camp when i grew up and on one hill we had uh, um a hill fort um, a disused quarry, a uh, uh, well, what was to become a dump full of old machinery. We had a witch's house. There were um, supposedly a mad monk, and you'd, you know, apparently people would find birds with sticks through their their beaks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was my playground. So you know, this one hill seemed to encapsulate you know almost everything that's outdoors in terms of den making and excitement and fear as a child or whatever so I you know that that was my whole childhood really was playing on Cabri Hill um and it, it just seems like a magical place that's out of a book now but um oh, so that, that's, that's probably the answer just you know one of those absolute 70s childhoods where every way every every gap in your time which wasn't school or doing some sport was was spent outdoors in in rivers woods streams hills that was that was my that was my playground Wow, that's that's really that's lovely, Garrett. And, and I, I, I'm just almost going there. Um, I'm I'm similar child of those seventies of that free. Um, and what's already coming out was just how I can see that creativity in your as a childhood imagination. Yes. Uh, dens, hills, um, the witch's house <laughs> <It> sounds fantastic. <laughs> um, already coming through, and um, you know, it, it's a, it, as you say, it's such a lovely question just to take us back to evoke what it was as a child that helped form. Um, carrying on from that, and when we're going to move you almost slightly forward into some of your perhaps your coaching backstory and, and yes. the beginning there. Um, and I wonder if you would just take some time out to uh, share with our listeners um, that coaching backstory, but particularly the moment that you decided to head outdoors and that sort of when was that moment and that connection yeah well I, I I don't use the word coach myself but that's because I'm I'm 
not trained or accredited. I, sure. I guess I, you know, there's a Venn diagram somewhere of, of everything, isn't there? <laughs> but, but, um, I guess, yeah. I feel like, I, I, well, I'd use the word coach perhaps and mentor in my background as a sort of business coach and mentor in terms of um, dealing with founders. And that was a big part of my work at the university. Yeah. Um, so I've always been a hiker, I'm a mountain leader. So I, I've always, you know, in spare time used the outdoors. And I think I always knew that it was my, you know, it was a place I went. So when I ran, um, the main sort of business in my background that we exited, you know, if I needed time to think about stuff, I would take myself off to the Brecon Beacon. So it was always there as something I did personally. And, um, and then it was a mixture. So I started a PhD and um, soon realized the PhD wasn't for me. And the, the book was a much better outlet because, uh, you know, there was no peer review and it, you know, happened quickly and it wasn't, you know, years of my life. Um, but I guess the, the freedom to start to research, you know, and going down rabbit holes, really. So I wasn't really researching the outdoors specifically. Mm. I was researching sort of creativity and entrepreneurship. And this took me down rabbit holes, which I got excited about um, and started to form in my mind. And then um, luck, serendipity luck's always useful, isn't it, in, in life and uh, it was actually a friend of mine asked me, knowing I was a mountain leader and I liked going outdoors, and I was always telling people I worked with, let's not sit in this room, let's go out and talk about this. So just unformed, but very natural, if you like, is something I did. Sure. He asked me to organize a trip, and this is about five years ago. Um, uh, so I took him and a group to Morocco, which I knew quite well, and the Atlas Mountains. And, and that's really that slight light bulb moment where it all came together i'd been reading about this stuff i'd done it myself and i took this group that didn't all know each other um off on a yeah it wasn't a we, we weren't bagging peaks and ropes it was just you know walking and talking in the atlas mountains um and that's where i sort of properly formed in my mind that this is is powerful and actually people have very different conversations and different relationships and deep stuff comes out whether you're you know aiming for that or not and that's why I don't use the word necessary coach or I didn't because you know I wasn't you know thinking about really what was happening it just happened naturally so that was the the real trigger for me to formalize one the thinking which turned into the book and also my practice of actually you know proposing that to other people as a as a way to to work I still go back to the Atlas Mountains a lot. It's a whole other bit for me is the, the sort of other cultures side, which I think is interesting as well. Being in, <laughs> being in a different cultural environment is very interesting for thinking as well. Um, okay. I haven't researched that much, but there's something in that, I think. Oh, book number two. <laughs> the culture factor. <laughs> Oh, I just was a moment. I was in Morocco. I've, I've taken groups myself to the Atlas Mountains, and it's just... The contrast between the UK, you know, if you're used to Wales and the Lake District in Scotland and they go to the Atlas Mountains, it's just yeah. so, so, so different, so raw, so exposed, so barren, bleak, yes. but beautiful in just such a different way. Absolutely. And, um, you know, similarly, I've got an expedition background, mountain leading, and that being out in a different culture, in an unknown environment, away from, you know, so many the normal life work and yeah. actually the opportunity the possibility kind of what is and and what I'm struck by and, and this is it's also kind of come up in a couple of our recent interviews is this natural evolution it you know a friend just asked you and you know it was elements of luck and actually in life that serendipity luck what just emerges organically is it can be so interesting and you know ultimately as coaches uh, you know, whether we label ourselves that is not you know sometimes we can be very much like goal orientated and process and we have to have this vision and actually sometimes things just happen yes yeah and, and, and following on for that that was you know the well ending up here and talking to you guys you know the the connections in the the school at the outdoor world and the coaching world have been fantastically and influential on me as well so i early in that i met uh 
coach in nature called Al Kennedy, um, who I don't know you, you've heard of. But um, so Al and I just absolutely hit it off and do quite a lot of work together. And um, some others, Fee McMillan, I know these may be people you, or names you know. So along the way, absolutely, the thinking's, you know, changed through those serendipitous and sort of accidental, you know, you should talk to. And, you know, there's, it's not a sort of, it's not that classic business, I need to talk to these five people as a prospect. It's just, you know, some random bouncing around of learning from each other, which I think's been fantastic. And that's what I love about this outdoor collaborative space community and lies at the heart of this podcast ultimately is how can we showcase the work of other people who are within this field and Paul and I were just commenting early on how varied it is Mm -hmm. it is just so diverse and we have so much to offer and share and this is where I'm going to segue nicely back to the book because clearly (laughs) the book is a great way to you know share your story convey your message and spread knowledge and the sitting down and writing a book as a project you know can be you know super easy for some people really daunting for others like how did you embrace embark on this project (laughs) well I think I I said obviously it's sort of the bones of it came out of a failed PhD so you know what did I have a stack of research papers and science which I was in books that I was interested in um you know obviously uh, the uh, you can read the book in one way, and I think it's quite obviously that way about sort of innovation and entrepreneurship and teams, and um, and that's that reflects my background. You know, that was the world I was in and where my credentials were, if you like. Um, I think writing it and definitely talking about it a lot since and working with people, you know, to your point about those varied people in the in this space, it's. Um, it doesn't really matter that it's, you know, you can, you can read it not as a business business book, but just as a, a thinking book, I think. And, um, and that's what I, I've come to learn. But the, the more practical bit was I, I, I don't know, I, I've never written a book before. Um, so <laughs> I sort of thought, well, I've got a book, there's a book in here I'd like to write. So I, I pitched it to, I pushed it to one publisher and they said, yes. So then I had to write it. Um, so that, that's, is that luck? Maybe that's, you know, some zeitgeist in there, which they picked up on. It's, um, you know, maybe me being sort of ballsy to just send it to a big publisher and see what happens as opposed to worrying too much. So, but that that's really what set, set me off then. So I had to write it and they were brilliant. Um, so, yeah, I think writing any book is probably hard and I'm not the most disciplined. I'm not a you know, I write a thousand words a day. It was very much um, a very loose process, but with a deadline. <laughs> um, but the beauty of it was that, you know, I could, I experimented on myself to write it. So, you know, the outdoors became even more important to my life when I was writing the book in terms of thinking about the chapters, how it was going to come together and etc. So I found it a real privilege to write. I loved being given time if you like or being allowed I don't know what the right phrase is but, <laughs> you know contracted even um to research and think and write so yeah real privilege to get a chance to do it um but mm-hmm. yes it was maybe a bit of a throw out a pitch and see if anyone bites and they did so I then had to do it <laughs> yeah, and, and, and my curiosity starts to. So, you, were you stepping outside, Gary, to write some of that work yourself? In mm. you know, yeah, absolutely. So, was that with others, or you know, were you going yep. out on your own and just entering into some creative thoughts around the chapters? Well, both and all of those. So, in a very regular way, using the outdoors to um, before I sat down and and, and wrote. Yeah. Uh, taking myself off into the wilderness for three or four days to you know do more concentrated writing and it coincided pretty much the writing period coincided with Al Kenny, Kennedy and I launching what we call outside business which is a, a Bristol Bath area sort of networking networking group mm-hmm. so we were out every two weeks with a random group of people um, whoever wanted to come along uh, which yeah. has been a fantastic sort of community movement in the area um so that was a great chance just to you know 
I wasn't experimenting on anyone, but uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, observe, observing and talking about what other people were getting out of, of being outdoors. Absolutely. Yeah. So just, yeah, just this resource right there at your, at your fingertips, almost as yeah. it were. Well, that, 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 that's fantastic. And really interesting for our listeners just to see that process of, of you, of you, you know, going through that book and, and completing that. So taking that, that, that on, um, perhaps I wonder if you would be able to share with us, because I'm, I'm, I'm immensely intrigued to, what are some of those key, I guess, sort of lessons that perhaps are coming out that you'd like to highlight for our listeners from from the book and and perhaps you know I, I think would give some real inspiration perhaps for people to use that creativity out there yeah so it's sort of centered on the fact that creativity is a big word isn't it and and I do talk in the book about how creativity is not the preserve of creatives you know it's um <laughs> and I and I when I'm talking these things I quite often say things like um, I've even visually done it. I haven't got my props today, but you know, paintbrushes, cameras, computers, whatever they are, aren't aren't the tools of creativity. They're just the tools of creative expression. We've only got one tool of creativity, and it's our imagination. And yeah. and when you apply that to business, which is obviously a part of the book, you know, I think the the phrase which really sums it up and comes out of the research is sort of imagined futures. You know, you can't not basing anything on some spreadsheets, you know, although that happens, um, or business plans or canvases, you, you've got to, you know, use this tool of your, your imagination to imagine what the future might be like. And um, so I really truly believe in that. And I'm not a big fan of sitting in boardrooms with whiteboards. And I talk in the book about how brainstorming's, you know, I think I go as far as saying people who suggest brainstorming chess and should be fired, but you know, maybe <laughs> not that far. But so that's I'm I'm a big believer in that, and I hopefully the science backs that up that that's uh you know, and you can think of it in you know, thinking outside the box, whatever, but you've got to be using and getting your imagination fired up. And what then I guess. I knew, but I was really pleased that the science backed up was that being outside in nature and especially moving in nature, walking in my yeah. sense, you know, are actually scientifically backed up as amazing ways to fire up that creativity. And I don't think it's any surprise, is it? Because I think I don't do, I don't go deeply into the evolutionary history, but um, mm. some other people do. Yeah. But I think it's just where we were designed to move and think. It's, it's what you know our bodies were designed to do. So it's no wonder that you know it's a fantastic place to imagine the future and to and to reflect. And you know, it all comes into it as well. But from my point of view, what I'm trying to do is get people to use the power of nature and moving in it and all the science they don't have to know the science yeah <laughs> yeah no, absolutely yeah. practice it and you will have different thoughts and i have a section on collective creativity so i think it's a really powerful thing to do on your own and i've experienced that but i think it's it's even more powerful in some because when i say collective it might be two people one-on-one -on -one conversation but it, it, i do quite a lot most of my work is with bigger groups of people hmm. and um and I think it's exactly the same. I think that there's a massive benefit to doing it. And there's plenty of, well, we can talk about some of the science, but, you know, it's a, um, that's not my science. You know, I, you know, the only sort of research I did for the book was more of the survey anecdotal side of, you know, yeah. do, you know do you experience this and what does it mean to you? Um, and... Then the third bit is really, I was then trying to build some methodology for people to use. Um, and that's very much just born out of my experience with, with teams. You know, I've just tried stuff. Um, and I say, I'm not, I'm not a coach, but maybe some of the things you know, cross over that quite well in sort of individual coaching, definitely less is more. I used to, maybe as an ex-businessman, I would try and fill, fill my days with people with quite a lot of structure and, um, actually you just let the outdoors do its work i think and the conversations and it is it's that thread of science 
I don't know, sometimes we get a little bit obsessed about, is it evidence-based? We need to prove it. Our logical, rational minds, they love it. Yes. We need the data. Um, and actually, okay, intuitively, what do we just kind of know? And it just, you feel into it and it, it just works. And, and taking that, and you talk about kind of methodologies um, and it, it is, it's that practical. It's the toolkit. It's the, okay, so how can we make this real? How can we apply it? What yes. do we actually kind of do? And it would be great to go either way with this, like science, you know, what are your, maybe your you know pet theories that you just love? Um, and then maybe, I don't know, a couple of methodologies, practical top tips that, mm. you know, our listeners love to have something tangible and real that, they can take away an experiment as well. So if you're willing to go, yes, pick one both. <laughs> the floor <laughs> is yours. So yeah, there's a. Li- I think there's a backbone of science that makes sense in the book. You know, there's a lot of. I, I reference a lot of science in the book, and hopefully people, if they they do choose to have a look at it or listen to it, you know, that, that'll come across. But um, I think uh, the soft soft fascination state within the tension restoration theory um, or therapy is really interesting. And that's, you know, this place where your brain is, you know, restored enough, but distracted enough to make good connections. And there's a fantastic paper from Benjamin Baird, American academic, called Inspired by Distraction, which was quite fundamental to my sort of journey here and it is a it's a proper scientific um, um experimental one where they were they were testing creative reasoning but they basically did it by having groups of people do nothing so basically slob around um so this wasn't in nature this one um do a quite a taxing but straightforward task so like a mathematical task or do a slightly distracting task and I probably got some numbers somewhere. Um, I won't remember them off the top of my head, but I think it's forty percent. The group who were doing a slightly distracting task, their creative reasoning was forty percent higher than the other groups. So it's this magical state, which is very similar, I think, to the soft fascination state of attention um, restoration theory, which is you know your brain's doing something which means it's, you know, it's in this default alpha mode and it's working, but it sort of opens up this creative bit. And again, I haven't looked at the evolutionary history, but if I was, you know, just making a stab, I think it's, you know, collective hunting in the savannah, you know, you, you've got to be thinking where your feet are going and doing cognitive mapping, but you can do something much more complex at the same time. So that was that was sort of quite inspirational to me. And then um, husband and wife team, the Atchleys in America, ran an experiment, a similar one, um, but taking people out in nature. And um, so similarly, it took people different lengths in different natural environments. And they, they did a much deeper experiment with things like tech-free or not tech-free. And again, a lot of the same... Um, um, levels of increase in creative reasoning happened so a lot of these weren't necessarily looking at the why <laughs> i'm not sure yeah. i'm sure everyone knows the why so there's sort of this inspired by distraction and not distraction which is you know sitting in your office and having the radio on or the you know and then this bit that nature was a uh, just being out in nature regardless of what you're doing is really important and then the whole mix of people, Amarily Apezzo, I don't know if you've, um, she did a famous TED, Dex, a TED talk about taking your meetings for a walk. Yep. A neuroscientist in um, Ireland called Shane O'Mara um, uh, in praise of walking. Yep. And um, a fantastic Norwegian academic called Mia Kainanen, who was looking at li- right down to tempo of walking and all sorts of things. But all this bit then around walking. So he's got this, getting your brain in the right state, how nature does that. And actually walking is quite, well, I would say this, but you know, hopefully it comes across, is actually, you know, an, a, an incredibly powerful thing. And there's probably lots of reasons for that down to, I talk in the book about, he's one of the pioneers of prosthetic limbs, an American called Bit Rolston. 
And um, when he was developing the first prosthetic limbs, he was trying to work out optimal gates and walking. And the same as Mia's work, you know, it just turns out that walking at a reasonable pace, not, not trying to get up mountains, um, you know, just affects your body and your mind hugely. So those are, the, those are the sort of backbone of the sort of outside for me was that, which just absolutely resonated with me. That you know, just by moving in nature and walking, you know, your brain works differently. And then to your point is how do you apply that? You know, it's great, yes. You know, I feel I feel good, I'm restored a bit, and I'm definitely having I'm definitely sorting some stuff out here. But how do you potentially make use of that was the next bit, which you, you know, I guess you were asking about the methodology side. Um I don't know the whole answer to the <laughs> methodology, but I'll share some of the some of the work I did. The most powerful stuff is always a mix between visual and verbal. Um, so, or when I say visual, maybe um, situational as well. So, the two two techniques I use, which always go down best, is um, natural storytelling. So on walks, I get um, participants to collect things on the way that just appeal to them. Um, some people are meticulous and want to find the prettiest rock. Some people just pick up a random stick or a bit of moss. Um, and then at some point on the work, walk at a sort of predetermined place outdoors, I will get that. It depends on the group, but either as small teams or individually to use those items to tell a story um depends what question they're carrying etc but something around you know what we've defined the day for um and that's always one of the ones people reflect as being the most useful lots of people then won't let go of those found items um you can probably just see there's my rock collection or part of it on the wall so i, <laughs> <laughs> I very much practice it myself uh, and the other one sort of related is, um, uh, you know, the what three words app? Mm, yeah. So um, you know, like other, you know, I'm sure your listeners can find out, but, you know, any, any location down to three meter squares gives you three words randomly. Um, so I use that a lot in terms of exactly where you're stood. You choose where you want to stand in the outdoors, in wherever we stopped. You get your three words through what three what three words and you have to put them into some narrative it doesn't have to be a story um it could be very practical it could be you know the sort of mission statementy type you know how would you describe your business as this um some people write haikus some people <laughs> make, <laughs> make dirty limericks probably but um um but again, one that they absolutely always reflect on. And what they reflect on on both of those is you know, how they always feel much more creative than they tend to think they are when you, before you've done it. They'll say, I didn't, I didn't know I could do that, or I didn't know I would, it would come out so well. Um, so that's two. There's, there's other sort of more practical, and some of my methodology is how to run sort of strategy days outdoors or board meetings outdoors which wouldn't necessarily have to be facilitated um but yeah those two which i think talks to that you know you are navigating a space so there's that side of it there's all the world the visual world that's going around you the conditions you're in mm. but also just by having walked for that 40 minutes or that hour you know, your brain is operating differently absolutely that's yeah I it's really lovely, Gary. And, and, and there's certainly, I know, I mean, I would certainly draw our listeners, as you say, to the Shane O'Mara in Praise of Walking. Um, it's such a great book, one that I particularly love. Yes. And if our listeners wanted to just uh, just dip a bit more, as Gary has said, into a bit of the evolutionary, um, I think that book picks that up beautifully, yes. actually. So just if any of our listeners are keen to understand that, uh, exploring on the savannah, and mm -hmm. some of the stuff of our reconnection, it's um, Gary rightly, it, it, it's there. Um, but I love that somatic, that whole brain and body working in a, a symbiotic way. Just um, and 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 of course, you know, 
how that creativity comes out. And what I wonder if you were able, respecting some confidentiality, of course, but maybe what have you seen, Gary, as the outputs in some of the people you've worked with? Um, you know, it, we've sort of talked there about the science nicely into the methodology. What 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 is it that you see this you know in a way the sustainability? What do they head away with? And yeah, there's probably lots of answers there. Definitely through the outside network we run, mm -hmm. you know, we have absolute converts and addicts, and I, and I have a um, it's not entirely based on well, it's a tweak of some other people's work in my book where I have a suggestion for a what I call the twenty three three so your 20 minutes a day and three hours every couple of weeks hike and three days a quarter somewhere out in nature. Um, a huge amount of people take on the 20 minute a day, which is as, as simple as taking a different commute. Uh, and I, I do put some rules on that. And, I, you know, and most of them do tend to take it up, which is key one is turn your phone off. Yeah. <laughs> you know actually pay attention to what you're doing in those 20 minutes so a huge group picked that up like one of my favorite groups we've worked with was uh they're very very deep tech and quite complicated to describe and that was their challenge hmm. um and that's where we started using some of the found stories so that company you know absolutely got some clarity out of that but the what I love about the story is not so much that they liked the work was they've actually now developed um, their own outdoor days, uh, which is how they deal with new clients. So when new clients, when they have a new client, they invite them down to their offices and they've designed a whole outdoor day for their clients where they, uh, and they use a lot of outdoor metaphor, which is the sort of one of the, I guess one of the simplest things to do, but they will absolutely take them on a journey from the office to the waterfall to the, and that's how they then describe their business to them because they mm -hmm. found it was so hard. It's probably like a, so it's an AI based business and you're know, quite hard to convey that story. So that's one of my favorite ones. They've actually embedded it into their business development as how they deal with clients, which I really like. Yeah, I love that. Um, I do quite a, my, my most addicted client, if you call it that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good, good from my point of view that we're always organizing the next one um the next walk so they definitely how they've decided to do their strategy and off sites is outdoors um, but they actually work in the i guess the well-being at work but in the in the sort of future of workspace so um it, you know, partly what i'm trying to do is get you know, to convince businesses and business people that this is work not it's lovely but i'm trying to convince them it is actually deep work and a place to do it um, they've absolutely embraced that but but they're now similarly offering you know a, and helping to facilitate outdoor work for their clients because they're 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 a tech business but you know doing um well-being data for businesses so they're getting the data about well, all sorts of measures of well-being i won't get to detail um but they're now trying to offer them, well, what can we do about that? How can we change this? So those are the two I like where it's gone. It's not about me or more business or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, actually, actually properly in my way embraced it and, uh, and building it into their business or their client relations, which I really like. Yeah. I, 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 I love the ripple effect. It's, it's that, okay, so this is, you know, this is my service, this is my offering. I work a lot one-on-one -on -one with clients and then you discover it's like oh so with my team I've been doing and yeah. oh this other conversation and now this business is trying this and it's and it, it links into um challenges which we'll speak in a minute and it's it's it's, it's this perception of the outdoors this this wider social perception that outdoors is for leisure yeah. indoors sat down is for work yes and mm. and actually this needs to be dispelled this really we need to get beyond that and you know your work is absolutely instrumental in doing that and listeners and watchers you're a part of this movement as well <laughs> so, yeah. and, you know literally it is a movement how can we move and be outdoors um 
so thinking about challenges mm. um that you have faced or are facing mm. um you know what 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 were they um and i love the way looking back to your your book that it came from a failure like a failure at your phd i just think that is just <laughs> something to to really be an advocate for you know you you try you fail you take a risk yes. and actually what success can come through that um so yeah challenges and overcoming or not um would be great to hear a bit more about yeah well failures are always interesting aren't they i, I do i haven't been brave enough yet but as a if you put the hat on as entrepreneur and i don't you know does that mean you've yeah, it's, a, it's a broad term, but you've struck it on your own in some way and taken some risks. So whatever those might be, you know, I think every entrepreneur or has a list of failures at lots of levels. And I do, you know, I've absolutely got total failed businesses and ideas. I've got, you know, ones that, you know, half got somewhere survived, but, you know, you look on LinkedIn and it's just the successes. So I, you know, I, I haven't been brave enough to put all the failures on yet. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I will one day. I'm getting braver. Um, start a movement to put everything you failed at on there. Um, so, uh, you know, I think anyone who's been on, I've been self-employed entrepreneur since my late twenties. So I you know, spent a lot more time in that world than employed world. And so faced everything in that from, you know, near bankruptcy to, you know, taking the risks of selling the house and spending every penny to all the normal cash flows and issues with staff. So in, in any entrepreneurial journey, there's all those challenges you've lived through. Um, in terms of this business, if you call it that, or my practice, my challenge is that changing people's perception of, of exactly as you've described, that this is serious and we shouldn't book another you know, I often use the word, you know, so, you know, the Watford Hilton, I'm not being mean to Watford, you know, for a meeting. Um, but even if it's a beautiful oak panelled country house, you know, I, I still think that's my biggest challenge is it's, it's hard to get people to, yeah, not see it potentially as leisure and time, often see it as work. And for my work, and maybe that's, you know, because I'm not defined as a coach is, you know, I get a lot of them. Is it team building? And it's like, well, there is some team building, but it's not rah rah, you know, rafting down the river team building. I do have some clients that I take up the top of mountains if they really want to. Um, but um, so that changing of perception is my biggest challenge in, in this world, I think, because I think an awful lot of people that have come across the book or read it or heard about it you know, I, I love the idea and lots of business leaders say, oh, we should, well, I'd love to do that. And, but it's like, okay, when we talk about doing it, it's like, well, it's just not high up that priority list. So that's, that's really my challenge is to try and change that perception. Mm. Absolutely. And, and Gary, I, I, you know, in, I think your energy, um, I don't know the word portal is coming up. There's something, I love the fact you said, this is serious. <laughs> you know what we can't mess around with this this is serious and there is something about that it feels like there's something that you're you're giving out around if i can offer a portal into this world and and bring that that as you say um we'll call it the watford <laughs> <laughs> office etc and out um and you know when i when i was reading some of your website which definitely encouraged some of the listeners to jump on there and have a look is uh, one thing that struck me was, and, and I, like you, many years in corporate business, when somebody starts to think, and this is a, a, a pose, a questioner with a, you, why do they walk to the window and look out the window in their in their boardroom? Or there's something in that. And as I was reading your website and what you've achieved, that thought came to my mind. And that that's something I would put out there to corporate world is, when you're looking for inspiration, why do you walk to the window and look out? Because that's probably you should keep going. Keep going out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm a, I'm a, there's obviously there's a whole world of bringing the outdoors inside into offices, and especially at you know, 
very wealthy companies, you know, the Googles, yeah. etc. Sure. And I, I wouldn't say I don't not like that. And as I talk about, there's a whole um, set of research around the benefits just of fresh, clean air in mm. offices, which is hugely powerful. But yes, it's sort of like it seems madness to to sort of spend millions on getting clean air into an office and some some greenery when it's it's just there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. There's a, a, a guy called Michael De Paola who runs a, a very successful networking group up in Manchester called Fresh Walks. Um, he's been doing it a long time and he's very passionate um, about just get, get bringing people of all walks of life and business together outdoors. Um, but he, um, I quote him in the book where he says, and I, I'll misquote, but the meanings there he says i wonder if in a hundred years we'll look back at the working conditions today like we do at the victorian mills and workhouses you know you you sort of think we've come a long way but we're basically you know or a lot of businesses and i'm being you know very broad brush you know we're tying people to this desk in front of a tiny screen mm. and and they'll allow them to go and play ping pong maybe <laughs> But I think a lot will still feel weird if you say, well, I'm just going to go for a 40 minute walk. I, I think, which I, I find very, obviously mm. I find very strange, but I hopefully that can start to change because I think the productivity that would come from that would be, yeah. you know, be absolutely worth it. Very thought provoking. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. And, and what a, what a great, uh, what a great thought provoking finish that. I mean, the last question really, um, what would you uh, recommend as resources that our listeners, you know, may want to just go and look at, jump into, just to kind of understand some of this a little bit more? Is, is there anything you can offer for, uh, for our listeners and watchers? Well, there definitely are a good set of books. And again, I'm, I don't know about a lot of the books may specifically potentially in the coaching and di directly in that in terms of um, practice. Um, we mentioned Shane O'Mara's. There's a couple. I, I did bring another couple about. I love this one, which is Frederick Gross, The Philosophy of Walking. Mm -hmm. So this is just lots of great stories of, of thinkers and writers of the past and yeah, you you so it's a really quick you know, great well written but a very quick one to realize that it's hard to find people from history who who were great thinkers and writers who didn't use them, the outdoors and nature that's the conclusion i came to you hard to find the ones who didn't um sure. which was um yeah quite inspirational to me i also like caroline williams book move uh, which is quite related to to um shane's book so I, I brought them because they're much more, I guess, about the just the outside and and um, and walking, which is this you know, that part of my philosophy, I guess, and and writing. I think the other one is things like outside and fresh walks. You know, I'm amazed now at LinkedIn about how you know how many more net walking groups are popping up. Mm. Um, and some fantastic practitioners out there in lots of areas in the UK, which is a really easy way just to access walking and talking. And, you know, I'm whatever your thoughts on networking, you know, at least it's not standing in a room with a warm glass of wine or, you know, a cold bacon, cold bacon butty at eight in the morning, you know, you're in a field Absolutely. somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Love um, Totally, totally resonate. And I hop back to, I, I arrived in the UK in 2015, having lived in Saudi Arabia and embarked on a networking spree, which was just soul destroying. And that was what sparked me to kickstart networking. Um, yeah. And networking when you Googled in 2015 was not a thing. Like literally, yeah. I think there was one guy up in Edinburgh who, and he wasn't actually active. It was just a, past website now it is everywhere yes. which is just mm. phenomenal i literally had a request day about there's a guy in, in italy like hey i'd love to know more about your networking it doesn't happen in italy but i yes. think it would work and <laughs> i was definitely let's spread the word and get some overseas um yes and, and there's a book i interviewed quite a few people um 
um, from you know, Nor- Norway and Scandinavia and a fantastic group out in walking mentorship out in Portugal. So there's a, yeah, there's a, mm-hmm. it definitely seems to be a great thing and a very easy way into, you know, having converse- different conversations outside. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it just, it, al- it aligns, you know, so, so well, you know, within coaching and community, building community, spreading the word, networking, networking. It's, it's all part of this bigger kind of business presence um, and all about connection ultimately at the heart of yeah. it all. But yeah. thank you so much for, for joining us today um, and giving an insight into your book about creativity. And, you know, the labels, coaching, entrepreneur, business, you know, ultimately creativity, we are human beings. We have, you know, this imagination and actually it is about the future. What do you imagine your future to be? What do you want to imagine your future yes. to be? How can you really tap into that? And mm. actually by getting us, you know, we are nature, getting us more connected with that, getting us moving, which we're designed to do, everything just comes together. And I think it comes down to we are complex beings. Mm. And yes, it's great having these science papers that go off and look at little kind of isolated elements of it though actually pulling it all back together what do we really know about consciousness and that in mm. itself is still there's a, a lot of a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and i think that talks to that i can't even say that question around is it is it work is it play well there's you know there is no work-life balance isn't it it's all life so um so Thank you so much for coming on. I just, I love this. I'm, I'm definitely, for me, I'm taking away this like natural storytelling and using items and the what three words as well. That's a really, really interesting tool to play with. Um, so thank you for that. And best of luck for the Business Book of the Year Awards. Um, oh, thank you. I hope, well, I hope it's just d- different enough that that's good. It could be bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it fell naturally into any category, so we'll see. Um, well, no, good luck. Good luck. Yeah, best of yeah, luck. Best really of luck. Best of luck. Um, so where can our listeners um, find out more about your work and get in touch if they'd like to? Um, so you know, I've been in tech since the early nineties, but I'm, I'm not. I'm, I don't have many social channels, so <laughs> I'm outdoors too I'm not much. Not sure what that says. <laughs> so, um, I'm just outside too much walking. So um, you find me on LinkedIn easy enough, and and that's where I tend to post quite a lot of stuff. My website is garypratt.co.uk, and that talks about the book and other podcasts I've done and my practice. Um, so those are the the obvious places. The book is available audio Kindle if people uh, apparently I didn't do the audio reading, but a fantastic voice author did, and apparently he's got a very soothing voice for you know a good one to take for a walk. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. When does the soft copy come out? Do you know? Uh, there's no, I don't know at all yet, but oh. when? Um, so it's published here in the US at the moment. Um, so that was last month. Um, I shall ask that question. Mm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, those are the places to find me. Um, yeah, I hope people take something away from this. And if they do read the book, you know, just start practicing some of it and getting outside. You know, my, my specific work is generally, say, with teams on on those longer journeys of multi-day trips. And um, if anyone's interested in that at all, then they'll find that out on the website. Perfect. Thank yeah. you for that. And we will we will link your website and all the resources as well that you have kindly shared we will make sure that they're up there we're really keen for the, the the website to be a bit of a portal into different research that people can access it Fantastic. and increase their knowledge um so that is what it is all about um and anyone listening in you know we'd love to hear your thoughts about this episode as always um and if you go and test some of the different methodologies out how it went we'd love to kind of hear feedback from you as well we totally understand this is a slightly different episode you know and um, gary's not a coach per se but i think very much there has been a lot that we can take away and adapt and ultimately coaching i believe it's we're a bit of a mongrel discipline we kind of were a bit of a magpie we kind of were a blend of so many different theories and concepts and ideas and we very much kind of cherry pick what 
we want to bring into our practice. So hopefully this is ultimately improved, giving you some inspiration and opportunity to deepen your practice. And as ever, this is one episode of many. Uh, we are storming through series five. I can't believe it. So if you have not checked out any of our previous episodes, please go back to the beginning and start your way to work through them. If you're not a part of our LinkedIn community, be grateful if you could join as well. And if you do like what you hear, please do share. We are really looking to increase our spread around the world and ultimately, hopefully, encourage other coaches, managers, or ultimately human beings, get outside, connect with nature, and move a little bit more. So thank you for your time joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank, thank you. It's been a real, ple real pleasure. Thanks, Kerry. Take care. So if you enjoyed what you've heard, like it, share across your network and subscribe to our YouTube channel and LinkedIn community page, The Coaching Outdoor Podcast. Thanks so much in advance for your support.